You've heard about how to run a business from your home or how to buy into somebody else's idea and make money for yourself. Next, how to make sure you're not throwing your money away. Also, the restaurant where everybody knows Forrest Gump. Eyewitness News starts now. This is Total Coverage on Channel 5 Eyewitness News at 10. Tonight's top story. This is, this is just a huge flood. It just overwhelmed everybody. You've responded to the site of this overwhelming damage, but tonight new questions are being raised about why Grand Forks wasn't better prepared. Good evening. Residents want to know why the people predicting the record crest weren't talking to each other. A new report reveals the National Weather Service was missing important information that may have given better warning. Channel 5's Ross Kurgis talked with forecasters today. And lots of people in Grand Forks say that they could have done a better job. Well, Mike and Angela, Eyewitness News has learned the National Weather Service underestimated the flood because forecasters made a basic mistake in calculations. Forecasters used a flawed formula, which critics say may be an $800 million mistake. The flood fight was valiant, but it turns out the sandbagging was a waste of time. People in Grand Forks say the National Weather Service simply screwed up. They relied on uh, automatic gauges instead of regular people to do the job, and we see where that got us. Weather Service forecasters say they warned this could be the flood of the century. Given the situation, I think the National Weather Service issued the best forecast that science and technology could provide at the time. But was it the best forecast? The National Weather Service now admits forecasters miscalculated how quickly the water would move down the river, something called discharge. Forecasters made a mistake using a flawed formula to predict how high the river would rise. They also did not take into account bridges would restrict water flow and increase the danger of flooding. Tragically, the Corps of Engineers had the right information, but never shared it with the National Weather Service. I, I, I don't know how, it, how exactly it happened. Bud Johnson is in charge of the Corps' hydrologists. The two agencies shared information, but no one realized the Weather Service was using the wrong numbers. Grand Forks engineers say the cities could have been saved with an accurate prediction. Corps engineers aren't so sure. This is just a huge flood. It just overwhelmed everybody and everything. It overwhelmed our, our technical abilities to make good forecasts. The Weather Service flood forecast was right on in most other areas, and it likely saved more than 20 cities from flooding, but the cost to clean up Grand Forks will be $800 million for possibly the biggest flood since the early 1800s. And Ross, in light of the Grand Forks situation, will there be some changes in the way these agencies communicate with each other? Well, they are going to reevaluate and try to find a way to make sure both agencies are using the same numbers and find a better way to share their information. All right, Ross Kurgis, thank you. There are signs of recovery through the, throughout the flooded areas tonight. In Crookston, fewer than 70 of the flood victims from East Grand Forks are still in emergency shelters. That's down from 600 after the mandatory evacuations. Also tonight, more people in Grand Forks are seeing services like running water make a comeback. About 75% of homes are expected to have water by tomorrow, but it won't be drinkable. The Red River remains a big concern in Manitoba, Canada. Flooding has forced 25,000 people from their homes. Winnipeg, the province's capital, is protected by a large floodway and a 25-mile sandbag dike. The water has crested here and is expected to start going down in a few days. It's been a long weekend of cleanup in the Grand Forks area. Many people are moving home for good, but many more are still waiting for the water to come down. Channel 5's Bob McNaney is live in downtown Grand Forks tonight. Bob? Angela, it's pretty quiet down here in downtown, as you can see. As you mentioned, things have been moving along pretty steadily. But people are realizing it's taking a lot longer to get back to normal than they thought. This town is literally in pieces, scattered for miles from downtown and all across Grand Forks and East Grand Forks. The good news here is that the curfew has been lifted, and about 25% of the population will be allowed now to live here permanently. They have power, water, phone, things like that. But across the river in East Grand Forks, the story is not so good. There is still a curfew in effect tonight. You know what really eats a guy up is walking through here and 90% of this stuff is like kids' toys. And Another long day of throwing out the things which help make a house your home. We're exhausted, yes, and we're not done. Betty Younger is helping an elderly aunt move out. That's her son carrying the box spring. He moved out of his UND dorm earlier. This is the stuff we're saving, actually. Uh, doesn't seem like it's going to end, no. Days are long. 
Much of Pam Matson's world now sits ruined, curbside. She may not move back in. I've worked at the university for a long time. I like what I do. If they don't fix my, if I don't get my house livable, then probably not, no. A handful of homeowners in East Grand Forks aren't even close to being able to get in and assess the damage. As an evening rainbow attempts to lift spirits, the people here are grounded in reality. I don't know. It'll probably be, hopefully we can, we're trying to get home by June. Now, the first gentleman's statement is proven right here. We're in downtown Grand Forks, and in the rubble, a pair of children's mittens. Here's what's going to happen here this week. Over in East Grand Forks, several hundred trailers and uh, mobile homes are going to come into the community so people can live at least until they can figure out if they'll be able to get back into their house or when they'll be able to get back in their house. Here in Grand Forks, there's a couple of blocks worth of this debris. And as we first told you last week, about 12 people who lived in this area were unaccounted for. That number is down to five. If they can't find them by Monday or Tuesday, they will send dogs in to make sure that there's no one in there. Angela? All right, that's Bob McNaney reporting live from Grand Forks tonight. Thanks. Here in the Twin Cities, police say it's a form of vandalism that just won't go away. Car vandals smashing up hundreds of windows, and last night we saw it on the east and west sides of St. Paul. Windows were shattered with BB guns, cement blocks, and sticks. In one of the neighborhoods, eyewitnesses spotted three teenage suspects in a car, but there have been no arrests. Over the past couple of weeks, hundreds of cars in nine different metro communities have been targeted. A shooting northeast of the Twin Cities this weekend is being investigated as a murder. Two people in Center City looking for a place to fish on East Rush Lake yesterday found a man who had been shot in the head. Chisago County authorities are not releasing any information on the motive or the man's name. The head of the FBI says it is possible a mechanical failure brought down TWA Flight 800. Today, Louis Free said investigators are leaning toward that as the cause of the crash. Also, he says there is no evidence of a missile attack on the plane or of a government cover-up. Free says the FBI hopes to close the book on the investigation by the end of the summer. 230 people were killed on Flight 800 last July. Officers are searching by air for two separatists on, on the loose in Texas because it's too dangerous to do it on the ground. They say the whole area is a big booby trap. Police have found dozens of pipe bombs, a propane tank filled with explosives, camouflage gas containers, and a trip wire. The other members of the Republic of Texas ha gave themselves up yesterday after a week-long standoff. A Tennessee woman is suing President Clinton's brother, Roger, to get him to pay her more child support for their six-year-old girl. Clinton had a daughter with Martha Spivey when he was single. He's married now. She wants $78,000 in back payments plus $1,000 a month to care for the girl. He says he can't afford that. People around the world today joined in Holocaust Remembrance Day. But in Germany, a new photo exhibit is forcing many Germans to once again consider the role their citizens played in World War II. These gruesome pictures, discovered recently in Moscow, show German soldiers killing Jews. Outside the exhibit, Germans argue with each other about whether this could ever happen again. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, candles are lit today in honor of the six million Jews murdered in Nazi concentration camps. In Japan, the newest way to commute is catching on. This fully automated train in Tokyo runs on the Seagull Rail Network. 